Hello there, and welcome back to the Introduction to English Linguistics. This is session 9, and in this video we're moving on from syntax to semantics, the study of meaning in language, and our specific topic will be sense relations. As always, let me start with a little uh, recap from what happened last time. Uh, there I talked about valency, and I compared the concept of valency to the chemical behavior of atoms that can form links um, with other atoms to form molecules. And some atoms can form rather heavy and complex molecules. They bond to several different atoms. Other atoms, say, can only form one bond and thus form very small molecules. How is that similar to verbs? Well, uh, verbs can pair up with different numbers of participants, subject, object, indirect object, and so on and so forth. So um, I mentioned that there are different ways of looking at valency, and I contrasted semantic and syntactic valency. Semantic valency being the perspective where you ask what participants are evoked by a verb. Uh, so if you imagine a situation of admitting, what participants do you imagine? Well, in the case of admit, uh, you've got to have somebody who admits uh, something that is admitted and then somebody who listens to uh, that which is admitted. If you take a syntactic perspective, you ask which of these participants have to be expressed obligatorily with a verb. Now, when you use the English verb admit, you have to use a subject and a direct object. You can't just say John admitted. Um, the very least you have to say is John admitted his mistake. You furthermore can say John admitted his mistake to Bob. So you can include an oblique object as an optional argument. Um, what this boils down to is that sometimes semantic valency and syntactic valency do not completely match up. Yeah, um, The listener who uh, perceives the admitting is also understood in uh, John admitted his, his mistake. He must have admitted it to somebody, right? He couldn't have admitted it to the wall. Um, but this somebody isn't expressed, at least not obligatorily. Right. Then I also talked about grammatical constructions. Um, and I want to say a little bit more about relative clauses. Now last time what I said was that uh, relative clauses are clauses that depend on a nominal structure. And you see here on the slide a syntactic representation of a relative clause construction, um, the cheese that the mouse ate. And uh, you see the top node there, it's an NP, so a relative clause construction really is a complex noun phrase. And the complex noun phrase branches into um, a smaller noun phrase, the cheese, yeah, that is the head of the relative clause construction, and then on the right side, the relative clause proper, which consists of a relative pronoun, that, that's sometimes also called the relativizer, and the clause, um, the mouse ate. And you notice that the mouse ate, that's a funny kind of clause, right? It's, it's missing its object. Um, if I say, oh, that's the cheese that the mouse ate, um, you understand that the mouse ate the cheese, uh, not just that the mouse was eating like it always was. Um, so you notice that I put the cheese in gray there uh, in, the, in the clause constituent, and below it I marked it with gap. Um, why did I do this? Well, in the linguistics literature on relative clauses, um, the element that is sort of missing from the clause, that's called the gap, because it's not there, it appears somewhere else, it appears as the head of the relative clause construction, but semantically it forms part of uh, the relative clause. So gap, that's a metaphor, of course, we need to take it with a grain of salt, but at least I wanted to make you aware that this terminology exists. Right, moving on then, uh, I also talked about complement clauses, and what I said was that um, 
well, complement clauses are clauses that function as either subject or object of sentences. And you remember that last time I introduced the syntactic definition of what subjects and objects are. Namely, subjects are um, daughters of S and sisters of VP, whereas objects are daughters of VP and sisters of V. And you notice that here, in this example, the complement clause is um, that the cheese was tasty. And um, this clause occurs in the object position. It's the sister of the verb and the daughter of the verb phrase. And uh, so it occurs in this example here, the mouse thought that the cheese was tasty as the object of think, yeah, the object of the verb think. <clears throat> it's introduced by uh, the form that, that's a complementizer, and it branches into a complementizer and a clause. And you notice that here next to the verb uh, form thought, I put in green CTV. Uh, that means complement-taking verb. And I pointed out that complement-taking verbs are typically verbs of cognition, think, of perception, see, and utterance, say. Those are the verbs that typically occur with complement clauses. Right. Um, with this in place, let's move on to the main topic for today, namely sense relations. However, before we get to sense relations, I have a rather lengthy introduction about semantics in general and different types of meaning. Let's get that out of the way first. Um, semantics is the study of meaning in general, that is, meanings of words, of sentences, of utterances. And let me add that it is the, me the study of conventionalized meanings, that is, meanings that are relatively context independent, that are don't very much uh, across different contexts. Later in this course we'll also get to meanings that differ a lot from context to context and there um, that's the area of pragmatics that deals with those meanings. Um, <clears throat> right, semantics, conventionally associations of a form a word or a sentence with a meaning. Um, lexical semantics, that's a part of it that deals with, well, lexical elements, words. Uh, lexical semantics is the study of word meaning and of the semantic relationship between words. <clears throat> um, okay, different types of meaning. Uh, there are three types of meaning that I want to distinguish here. And those, um, well, the most important uh, type of meaning really is referential meaning. Referential meaning, um, <clears throat> okay, <laughs> um, there we need to distinguish two terms, namely referent on the one hand and sense on the other. What's a referent? Well, a referent is the thing in the world that is pointed to by a word. I have here uh, our landline telephone and I can point to the telephone and say, well, it needs to be charged sometime soon. I can also talk about um, the invention of the telephone and that would not be a thing that I could point to. That's a general idea that I can convey to you via language. Mm, so why am I making this distinction? Uh, referent and sense. Well, there are words without reference. Think of unicorns. You have an idea of what a unicorn is, but um, nobody has a pet unicorn. Uh, we can talk about Quidditch through the ages. Uh, Quidditch, that is the sports game that the magicians in the Harry Potter novels play. Yeah, uh, and there are abstract ideas such as the number pi um, or the number two. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the number two, that's nothing in the world either. Uh, I just picked the number pi because it's nice. Right, that's referential meaning. And in sense relations, we'll be mostly concerned with referential meaning. 
but there are other types of meaning, among them social meaning. Um, when I utter an innocent looking sentence, like I'm going to the grocery store to pick up some milk, um, this sentence conveys information about my social background, my social allegiances, because I said the word grocery store. And um, people from the British Isles will notice that, well, this is not really how we say things. You, young man, are from somewhere else. And that's right, of course. Um, so, some words carry information about who the speaker is, okay, what the speaker, um, what community the speaker belongs to. Thirdly, there is something called effective meaning. I can describe a state of affairs in different ways, uh, which are revealing my emotions or attitude. Yeah, um, I can say, uh, oh, that's very good. I can say, hey, that's cool. I can say, way to go, uh, or I could say, dude, um, all means basically the same thing, but there's a difference in uh, my emotions or attitude um, towards what I'm describing. So words uh, can share their referential meaning, but have different social or effective meanings. So lift and elevator share their referential meaning, but they have different social meanings, uh, different people use them. And um, <clears throat> the sentences John is determined, John is stubborn, John is pig-headed, share their referential meaning, they describe the same situation, but they display different effective meanings. Right, um, here's an example of different effective meanings. Um, these are two lawyers talking. Lawyer 1 says, what are we working on? Lawyer 2 says, the pen court case. Lawyer 1, oh, that terrible creature who killed his grandmother? Lawyer 2, allegedly, Helen, we're on the defense's side. And uh, Lawyer 1 says, oh, that poor, socially deprived and fatherless child who's wrongly accused of tapping a hammer against an 80-year-old woman's skull. Same uh, referential meaning, different effective meaning. Right, um, so referential meaning, whoa, 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 okay, here we go. Uh, referential meaning, um, that's what a word or sentence denotes, that's its denotation. Uh, social or effective meaning, uh, that's what a word connotes, that is its connotation. Denotation, connotation. Um, different types of meaning and I think yeah that's all I wanted to say before we actually get to sense relations sometimes called lexical relations um, seven of them we have to, to go through in this video hyponymy meronymy synonymy antonymy conversness homonymy and polysemy quite a few onomies here they're not your enemies they're your onomies and um, well, there's really nothing to be worried about with this list. Many of these you will recognize, um, not under this term, but you know the concept. Let's start with hyponymy, which really denotes a relation between categories. Um, a vehicle uh, is a category, and <clears throat> there are different types of vehicle, namely train, car, bus, bike, plane, and so on and so forth. And uh, each of these uh, subcategories has further types that it comprises. So different types of car are sedan, that's a regular four-door car uh, with a trunk, um, sports car, convertible car without a roof, uh, jeep, pickup, um, yeah, those are types of car. And uh, the terminology now is that Jeep is a hyponym of car. It's a kind of car. And a vehicle is a hypernym of car. So hyper, that's the upper uh, layer, and hypo, that's the lower levels. And a useful term to remember here is the word co-hyponym. Co with an O, and hypo also with an O, so two O's, 
and that refers to um, members of the same category. So Jeep and pickup are co-hyponyms of car. Easy as that. Moving on, Meronymy, the diagram looks a lot like what you've seen just a second ago, but here we're dealing with part-whole relationships and not with categorical relationships. So um, a car is a complex object with a gazillion parts, tires, windshield, hood, engine, bumper, bumper sticker, and so on and so forth. And an engine in itself is again a complex object that has many parts. It has pistons, oil pumps, cables, uh, whatnot. Right. Um, piston then is a meronym, fancy word for a part, of an engine. And car is a holonym, fancy word for the whole thing of engine. Yeah, holonym, whole, meronym, that's a part. Moving on to synonymy, and you know this one. Uh, synonymy, that's the case when two words mean more or less the same thing. Um, start and begin mean roughly the same thing. Stop and cease mean the same thing. Lawyer and attorney uh, mean the same thing. And sometimes they're not just two synonyms, but rather a whole range of them. Think of movie, flick, film, motion picture. And here you see that these actually share their denotation, but they differ in their connotation. So movie and film, you might say, those differ along the British-American axis. Um, motion picture and flick, well, you use these terms in different situations, right? Flick, uh, that's a very conversational uh, way of referring to a movie. Yeah, that's a chick flick. Um, motion picture, you only ever hear that in advertisements, I think. Uh, the latest motion picture from Universal Studios, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, so the connotation of these terms is different. Moving on to antonymy, um, I brought you the actual book Unfortunately, you're seeing it in the mirror as its mirror image. It's called Opposites by Sandra Boynton, and I highly recommend it. It's one of my favorite books. Um, it goes something like this uh, big and small, short and tall, high and low, fast and slow, heavy and light. That's this picture there, day and night, in and out, whisper and shout. Weak and strong, right and wrong. Yeah, here, yeah, right and wrong. Okay. Um, there are two types of antonyms. Um, one type uh, is exemplified by rich and poor, tall and short. Those you call gradable antonyms because, well, there's a continuum from being rich to being poor, from being tall to being short from being heavy to being light. And there are non-gradable antonyms. Uh, think of even numbers and odd numbers. There is no middle ground from being an even number to an odd number. You're either one or the other. Same, different, well, you could argue, but um, <laughs> truly the same, that means not different. Yeah, married means not single, although many people would argue that there's a continuum from being single to being very, very married. Right. Um, moving on to converseness. Um, those are terms like uncle and nephew, above and below, buy and sell, which are often um, mistaken for, for antonyms. And in fact, I think here in this book, there are uh, converses, um, well, opposites. It's not called antonyms, so you can't uh, fault Sandra Boynton for this. Um, that's a petty criticism of linguists. Um, converses describe the same situation from opposite vantage points. So in the doctor patient situation, you know, uh, if I am your patient, you are my doctor. If I am your student, you are my professor. 
<clears throat> Easy as that. The conversion test will tell you whether something is uh, whether two terms are converses or, in fact, antonyms. <clears throat> so, uh, before we get to homonymy and polysemy, the last two on the list, um, let me show you this slide here. In a normal sign, normal in scare quotes, one form maps onto one meaning. Mm. In the case of synonymy, we have several forms mapping on the same denotational meaning. In homonymy and polysemy, the opposite is the case. We have one form mapping onto several meanings. Now, homonymy and polysemy are a little different from one another. Um, homonymy is exemplified by words such as bank, which can refer to the sloping margin of a river or a financial institution. Race can refer to a competition or a genetically defined population group. Um, or down here, I've googled the word bat and I uh, use picture search. And if you use Google picture search to you know, give you some bats, uh, here are some pictures of, of bats. And you notice that some of them are animals and other of them are these uh, hitting instruments. So that's homonymy. Um, and what homonymy is all about is a word having two distinct meanings, meanings that do not have anything in common. Contrast this with polysemy. A summit can mean the top of a mountain or it can mean a meeting at the highest political level. Uh, a paper can refer to a writing material, something like... Uh, here I have some paper. And uh, paper can also refer to a document written on paper or, in fact, stored as PDFs. So on my computer, um, I have a gazillion of linguistics papers stored as PDFs. Right. Um, so polysemy is one form with two related meanings. And uh, this relation may be fairly obvious, as in, you know, writing material or a document written on paper. Or it, uh, it, it, it may be quite tenuous. So the picture that you see there is, uh, well, a table. But if you look at it closely, it has the per periodic table of chemical elements uh, etched on its surface. So somebody with a nice sense of humor etched the periodic table of elements onto a wooden table made for dining. Um, playing on the relation between these two senses of table. Yeah. So homonymy, one form with two unrelated meanings. Polysemy, one form with two related meanings. Right, and that's actually it for this session. Here again you have the pictures for the seven sense relations that we talked about here. Um, hyponymy, concerned with category relationships, meronymy, concerned with part-whole relationships, um, synonymy, converseness, antonyms, um, <laughs> polysemy, and homonymy. All right, it's getting late. Um, I'll see you next week.